Um, I'm so incredibly happy to be, uh, you know, just speaking with both of you um, about your films. Um, and I'm, I'm really happy to also share these films as well with, with many others. And, and yeah, I mean, you know, um, these films, uh, both of them have had their, um, you know, they've been around to different festivals and uh, Alitia's, yours too, is, is now, like, that was 2011, right? 2010. <laughs> 2010, yeah. So, so 10 years now since, since making that film, since it was released. So it's, it's been a while, uh, but you know, it, it's still nice to, to revisit these. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I wanted, I felt like they were, um, I felt like they were both fitting to my next exhibition uh, here, at the, here at the Winnipeg Art Gallery um, called Inuk Style. Um, and it, yeah, it focuses on, uh, <laughs> yes, it focuses on um, a lot of the Inuit clothing and jewelry and, um, yeah, all of the accessories, parkas, the atigi um, that we have in our collection and also from the government of Nunavut collection that we hold here. Um, yeah, I, I just thought that these two films um, just went together perfectly um, with, with this theme of, of showing Inuit identity and how it's expressed, like not only through clothing, um, but through tattoos as well. Um, mm. But yeah, so to start off though, maybe we'll, we'll introduce, introduce yourselves. Because um, <laughs> I, I, you know, not everybody, not everybody, will know who you are. <laughs> uh, Olivia, if you want to go ahead. Yes. So I'm Olivia Tumasi. I use my artist name, Olivia Willock, uh, sometimes uh, for my artwork. I'm originally from Kangetsuk in Nunavik, but um, I lived in Montreal since I was like eight. My father is um, French. And I made wearing my culture because it's something that I noticed living in Montreal, how much, uh, like when I take the metro and everybody's wearing black coat in the subway and how I kind of find it um, boring. <laughs> I don't want to say boring, but uh, compared to the clothing that my family, my relatives make, up north for winter, I think it, it's the place where um, where we can be stylish in the winter. Not everyone <laughs> can um, have such kind of clothing, but it's also deeper than that. Like um, I grew up without my mother and doing beat work or sewing, a lot of people told me, oh, you're good at it because uh, your mother was also great at it. and um, most of the women um, from my family, they all make clothing and also on my father's side. So it really feels like um, um, a sense of uh, belonging to be able to make a clothing um, that was passed down from a generation to another generation. It's so empowering and also for the younger generation to have not only traditional clothing, but contemporary kinds of one, like uh, with tunit on them or uh, like flowers or like designs that Inuit really loves. It's very empowering and it makes us feel like uh, we also have um, like our space to take, uh, like uh, Victoria Kakutunik at the, uh, who went to um, different kind of fashion events uh, internationally. It gives such a sense of pride to know that we also have our space to take uh, within that. Yes, definitely. And like there's so many um, contemporary uh, seamstresses these days too that are making such beautiful, um, beautiful atiki. And not only just, you know, the beaded, but just 
All the ones, yeah, all the ones. <laughs> um, Alicia, if you want to introduce yourself too. Uh, yeah, I'm Alicia Abgil on the and I'm from Iqaluit in Nunavut and um, born and raised here and still live here and uh, of course have traveled a lot for my work as a filmmaker um, until COVID hit <laughs> and now I'm um, at home mostly so it's been a really really nice um, break actually from travel to be able to just be home and rest and um, I mean work lots still but rest in terms of travel. I feel like travel has lots of beautiful things to it, but it also takes some some kind of energy reserve inside me. So it's been really wonderful to stay home and recharge and not be on planes all the time. Um, and I agree. First of all, Olivia, I want to say that your film is so beautiful. I love it. It was so, um, makes me so proud to see, you know, like, you know, being proud of their creations and their family and wearing the, you know, wearing the love of culture in your family. So it was just really touching and beautiful. So, and I feel like, um, you're right, Jocelyn, the, the two films I think work together as a theme very, very well. Cause, um, my film, Dunit is all about the rec reclamation of Inuit tattoos and it's also wearing culture right um i call it my permanent jewelry <laughs> um it's uh you know it, it's also about passing down love of family and identity and and being proud of our culture in an outward way expressing it in an outward way so um yeah i thought the two films fit together really nicely mm -hmm. yeah i was um yeah, even just thinking about it this morning as I was, you know, also trying to think about um, what sort of questions I'd be asking you. Um, I have a few questions, you know, jotted down, but I, I kind of wanted this to be a little more conversational too. Because um, I'm also, I'm a little nervous. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so... It's just <laughs> <laughs> um yeah no that that's what I, that that's what i was thinking about this morning um like how the these two films um you know even though they're really short films and like your uh, yours alicia is a short documentary um compared to you know your other films that you've made like angry inuk and then also how you've been involved with um like feature length films so um what i loved about these two films is like in that short amount of time you actually do get this sense of pride of Inuit pride and like and you're proud of who you are and like yeah you're where where you're coming from as well and it really oh I loved it when I first um, saw your film uh, Olivia uh, so that was that was made with Wapakoni Mobile, and they're based in Montreal, but they've been producing these short films with many indigenous communities, um, uh, even across Canada now. They're starting to, you know, really branch out and, um, yeah, have, uh, they, they give the um, uh, youth mostly an opportunity to, to create short films. And, and uh, maybe, maybe uh, if you want to talk about a bit about that process too for you, how that was working with Wapakoni and um, yeah, maybe, maybe talk a bit about, you know, your ideas too that went into this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I got introduced to Wapikoni when I was still living in Montreal and when I'm back when I went back to Karnitsuk uh, for a year. Um, well, I kept begging Wapikoni to go in Karnitsuk. I knew so many talented artists in my community and I always begged them to come. And then when I went back to live there, they told me that they had a space to go up north. So I worked with the, the community to be able to uh, rent a space and rent a car for them and find a place with the, all the materials. And um, 
I don't really remember the process of how I went to make wearing my culture, but uh, I really like to film details of uh, random stuff or taking pictures of random stuff in details. And uh, I had these poilux looks that my Ayak made me. They were, they were so beautiful. I still wear them with the uh, purple silk skin and beadwork. It's so pretty and all the clothes and the also being living back in Kainsuk to be able to wear uh, uh, comfortable clothes to go outside. Some of my family members gave me coats and everything. So I was just so glad to have all of these um, outfits to wear and seeing everyone also in the community wearing all kinds of clothes, clothing. Um, and also realizing that not many people outside of, uh, who, some people who are not very aware of uh, the Inuit culture and the clothing and um, all of these uh, aspects are so present. And also um, it's kind of, um, I noticed that in Kainsuk, uh, some people are like, you know, they, they wear that all the time. So they take it for granted that uh, the, these beautiful clothes, uh, not everyone can be able to, uh, to see how much they're beautiful. And um, I just wanted to show that. And also there was um, um, a workshop in Kainsuk at that time that was making um, Silking boots, Kamituina, from the beginning to the end, from scraping uh, the skin, taking care of the skin and everything. So it was, uh, um, I think it was also inspiring to see all these women coming together to make uh, uh, boots. So it kind of just come up together at the same time. And it was also uh, very cool to see the films that were done um, in Kainsuk, uh, a man in my hometown who makes uh, ului, and he's a carvo also. He uh, made a short film about making an ulu, and these two young girls, they made kata uh, chatu kainsumi, and they went internationally, which is uh, very awesome, and I was very proud. So it was it was very interesting, and I was very happy that they were able to go up north. And uh, I wish for them to go further because there's so much to say. Inuit culture, so many stories, so many things that can be explored. So I really wish for them to go another time. <laughs> no, definitely. And um, yeah, the, the other short film about the, the throat singers, um, that, yeah, that one went to Sundance, the Sundance Film Festival. Yeah, um, awesome which was pretty amazing. I think it was, yeah, two years ago now, mm -hmm. I believe. Um, yeah, that one's also a really great short film. And I think I, I think that one you can watch in full mm -hmm. on, on the Wapakoni um, mm -hmm. website. Um, yeah, and uh, <laughs> it looked so cold though. <laughs> oh yeah, we were freezing. Um, when we were filming, I think we brought all the batteries we had and like every five minutes we have to change them put the, one of them in inside our pockets and like close to the, or like chest to keep it warm uh especially for uh names of snow that my cousin um filmed one of the days that we went outside to film it was a little bit of a storm and it was very windy and i think we filmed for like 20 30 minutes outside and all the battery ran out <laughs> but it was incredible i also took the opportunity to um uh to take some 35 millimeters photos and she was with her kid mariana who is very adorable and she loved being part of it and yeah I, we were freezing but it was worth it. <laughs> Definitely. Um, 
and yeah, and another thing too that I love about your film is is that it, it's all in, you know, the Inuktitut or like, well, I guess the, mm -hmm. is, is there, um, is there like regional dialect? Like the, maybe the Nunavik? Mm -hmm. wow. Yeah, uh, I don't speak Inuktitut anymore. So I asked my aunt to translate a poem I wrote in Inuktitut and I think it's very helpful for me. Uh, um, I've been trying to relearn Inuktitut, but I find the best way is um, having sentences that I have to uh, repeat and repeat until I pronounce it well. And yeah, so my aunt was a very great support for that. She helped me a lot in pronouncing and you did a great job. I, I I wouldn't have been able to tell that you don't speak by the, the audio and the film. You did really well. Yeah. And it's the same for me. Um, I mean, I grew up speaking Inuktitut, but I really lost a lot of my Inuktitut when I left for school. So when I came home, I really had to work hard to relearn. And uh, it's part of the reason I left, fell in love with filmmaking is uh, working as an assistant editor and um, I'd have all the written translations in front of me and then the footage of elders speaking and I had to match up the, the translations with the footage to f for subtitles. Mm -hmm. And it really um, helped me regain so much vocabulary and grammar and it's part of the reason I fell in love with filmmaking. And, mm -hmm. and then when it comes to narrating my own films, my mother um, translates, it all, translates it all for me and rehearse and rehearse and rehearse. And I really, um, I, I totally agree that, um, having to repeat sentences that are important to you, that where you really have something to say that you want to say um, and to have to repeat it over and over again. It's such a powerful way to like burn it into your memory. Yeah. yeah. I actually made my third film uh, with Wapikoni. I named it Inuit Languages in 21st Century. Uh, I wanted to say Inuit language, Languages instead of Inuktitut because um, I, at first, I wanted to have someone from each uh, region of uh, Inuit Nunanga. And, but um, I was able to get a friend from Nunavut and a friend from um, Greenland. And uh, it was a part, I was talking about, um, I wanted to get into uh, identity with the language and also exploring what is available on the internet for the language, uh, there's um, in it to do to Salanga, their uh, Nunavik school board, they have um, some games for children in Inuktitut, which I use sometimes to like uh, get get some words into my hand. And also to make uh, some people understand that they can make some research online and they can find some stuff related to Inuit. <laughs> and like, yeah. Um... You know, it's, it's nice to see visually too, like what, what you're referencing, like the quadrupes, you know, and you hold up, yeah, the, your mitts that you made. And um, yeah, it, it just gives that extra, extra bit of understanding too for, for other Inuit as well that are also trying to learn. So yeah, it was, it was, it was great that way as well with your film. Yeah, the music in that too. I thought it was so great. It was so much fun. Um, yeah. Was were they? Uh, was that a local? Yeah, my cousins. They um, they were in a band before uh, named Hatagi. The the cousins, and they mix throat singing with the beatbox. And uh, one day asked me. Who, what I wanted to have as music, I uh, thought of my cousins right away because uh, they're very great at improvising and adding throat singing to beatbox. Um, yeah, is there, uh, so you mentioned uh, you made your third film. Is there anything that you're working on now or, or have you been working on many things, you know, during the, this pandemic? <laughs> I've been mostly uh, beating and sewing lately. 
Uh, I've been filming myself while I'm beating. Um, I want to try to make some ASMR kind of videos. <laughs> but um, I'm always thinking of films I want to make. And I, I think I want to try to go to um, uh, L'Institut National de l'Imagerie du Son, a school here in Montreal, private school to uh, uh, to work in a specific field in cinema because I always have ideas of stories that I would like to see on TV, on a film, something like that. But I think I'm a little bit too ambitious sometimes. So I will need to gain a little bit more experience and learning a lot more about um, cinematography to be able to like transform what I have in mind into a real film that people could be able to watch. But for sure, like, I will definitely make some films in the future. Yay. It's good to be ambitious. <laughs> um, but it's also good to know what, um, to know what you're biting off to chew. And um, yeah, I think it's great to make I wish I made more short films before I launched into making feature length films. It was really difficult <laughs> uh, to jump straight into longer format films. Um, so I think you've, you've done a great, a great thing by doing a few short films and, and moving your way upward. It's, but you should, th you should think big, you should think, you should dream big. I'm glad to know that you're, you're doing that. Thank you. Your film, uh, um, you know, as you were as you were just saying, like it was kind of uh, well, it, it 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 can be almost like a short feature feature film. <laughs> it's a mid length doc. Yeah, it's a t television hour, which yeah. is like forty six minutes or forty eight minutes or something. Yeah. Yeah. Um, like, and and had you had you thought maybe about um, like even making a longer version or was that or even like when you were filming this was was there like a kind of unedited original? <laughs> oh my god, that film could have been hundreds of hours long. Um, I because I interviewed sixty elders from across Nunavut and. Um, you know, it was so hard to cut it down to one hour, um, but it's, it's, it was made for TV and you're given a certain time length and you have to stick to it down to the second uh, when it's for television. So I didn't have a choice. Um, and also back then it wasn't such an option to have like um, self-distribution on online. Um, you know, since then things like Vimeo have been created, right? Um, but I started working on, on that film in 2005. So, um, like it was before most people had social media accounts in Nunavut anyway, people were just starting to get into social media. Internet was much, much worse. It's still crappy here, but internet was barely functioning back then. So just doing online streaming of Inuktitut content was, um, it was possible, but it, wouldn't have reached reached very many people back then so um so i really had to cut it down to an hour which was a a heartbreaking process because there's so much beautiful storytelling from all the elders i interviewed um and some young people as well who um, um just a few young people i interviewed as well who uh, were also getting tattooed at the time um because back then like um, there were, there was almost no one left with traditional tattoos. There were a couple of elders that I didn't know about that had kind of hidden tattoos on their arms. And there was one last, um, living elder with face tattoos at the time, but she passed away before I could go visit her. Um, so, um, there were uh, a few young ladies starting to get tattoos at the time and um, I really wanted to show them in the film too but it was like all these elders and their wisdom that I wanted to share so we kind of had to make really tough decisions and 
but they're they're the same um, young women that have become like leaders in our traditional tattoo community and tattooing, learning to tat be tattooists themselves as well. So I would love to go back over all of that footage and put it all out online. Um, but as you know, Olivia, it's a huge amount of work to edit a film um, and with hundreds of hours of footage it's a monumental task that um, I'm gonna do someday but it's yeah. it's not just um, a quick upload to YouTube <laughs> with this kind of material it's it's just a huge project but um, yeah it, it um, you know it, it very well could have been a feature documentary but back then it was also much harder to get funding um, as an Inuk filmmaker um there were very few of us and now there's more and it's great and um i feel like the film industry is much more supportive now of indigenous voices in the film and television industry but definitely back then it was a really very much an uphill battle to um to get stories like ours on tv at all never mind like a feature length uh, film so yeah it, it is what it, that's what it ended up being a TV hour and um, I'm still surprised to this day how often I get asked by people to see it it's 10 years old now but yeah no it, it's like that's it's great then for you um, you know to keep to keep talking about it as well um, and and somehow it still feels very yeah even though it's 10 years old um, it still feels very relevant. But yeah, the, looking back on it now and thinking about, you know, how far in those 10 years and how fast things have changed, mm -hmm. um, it must be, it must be kind of heartwarming too for you to see so many um, of the younger generation of Inuit nowadays that are, that are reclaiming the, the, the tattoos and um, mm -hmm. like, I don't, I don't even know how many um, young Inuit tattoo artists there are nowadays. Mm -hmm. um, not, not just, you know, not just here in Canada, but like in Greenland and yeah, across mm -hmm. the circumpolar regions. Um, yeah, it, for you, it must just be exciting. It's amazing. I, I am so thankful um, for the resurgence and um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to lie. I think my, my documentary paid, played a part in that. Um, and I'm really proud of the film for that. So it's, it was my first film and it was many years ago now, but it's definitely something I'm, one of the things I'm most proud of in my life. I mean, I think the resurgence was already happening. It's, it's not entirely because of my film that there were a number of women already, researching the tattoos and, and planning on getting them. So it just, just, I think it was just the time for them to come back. Um, but I'm really glad that my film was able to make it a bit easier for young women to access the stories and, and learn a bit about them uh, and open up conversations in their own families. Um, Cause there, I, it was, it was a time where it was um, taboo subject. People didn't talk about it. And um, I, you know, I think most people of, of my generation and younger didn't even know they existed um, until at the Etan Altrat film came out. Uh, mm. And when, when that film came out, suddenly, because when I started researching for my film, my friends would be like, what are you talking about traditional tattoos? I've never heard of that. And then um, as I was working on the film, Etan Altrat um, um, came out and suddenly everyone knew exactly what I was talking about when I mentioned tattoos, um, when I mentioned Dunit. So that just goes to show the power of filmmaking and keeping uh, things alive in our culture. So um, I, I love um, your film, Olipika, because it's such a great snapshot of time, mm -hmm. like what the kinds of clothing that people wear from a particular community at, at a particular time. And it's all like modern clothing, what people are wearing right now, what your family has made. It's just such a great portrait. Um, you know, sometimes when you make a film, it's easy to get pressured into like doing something that represents everybody and go everywhere and do all the different times and all that. And um, 
you know, I think it's, it's, it's perfectly valid and a beautiful thing to tell your own story of your life right now. And that, that can be a really powerful uh, portrait. So I love your film for that. Yeah, I love your film too. I think I saw it for the first time two years ago. And I don't remember when I started, like I started seeing some arts including to meet on them and I was wondering um, what is it about and I was like late teen when I, uh, when I learned for the first time that women used to have t tattoos and what I also noticed in Nunavik is uh, there's some stuff related to the culture uh, that we say that it, it didn't happen in Nunavik which is not true. Some people say that uh, people in Nunavik didn't have to need, but um, we have uh, traces and proof that we had some to need. So um, it's like really starting right now. Um, I see a lot of girls of my generation getting there to need in, even though they are like living in the city or even if they're relatives, um, it's still taboo in their family. It, uh, they wear it with so much pride that it gives, uh, um, there's so much to learn about these women related to their tattoo and it's very inspiring. And uh, what you did, Alethea, was so important. Thank you, thank you, yeah, there is, there's a number of um, number of people that took some brave first steps. Like I wasn't the first one of of my generation to get tattooed, and um, it's it's really helpful sometimes when someone takes that first step, and then it makes it a little less scary for the next person. Mm -hmm. So you know, people like Kovac and Selena Kalluk and um, Oh, I, I, I can't name them all, but there were a number of women that were the first in their area to get tattooed or just start doing the tattooing. And, you know, um, it's, our tattoos never completely died, um, but they came close. And, and um, I'm really grateful to all the, all the women um, of that time that made it a little less scary to, to take that step of, of bringing them back. It was a lot easier for me to make my film knowing that I wasn't alone, that there were other women that were taking those steps too. So, um, you know, it's, um, yeah, it's been a long journey and it's, you're, you're right, Jocelyn, it, it gives me so much joy to see um, people with tattoos everywhere now and when, in the early days when I first got my tattoos and there was there was really only a handful of us, like I could count them on one hand. Um, I was like really noting who had tattoos and where they got them and who did the tattoos and all that. And then at some point I realized they're just everywhere now again. It's like, I, I don't even feel the need to say, hey, what's your name? Where are you from? Who did your tattoos? Like, um, I still love to have those conversations, but there's so many of us now that it's not um, not a big deal anymore. I mean, if, uh, it can still be a big deal within your family or community, but um, just on the whole, it's not surprising to me anymore when I see an Inuk with traditional tattoos, even on the face. And um, I never would have been able to imagine that, you know, 10 years ago, that it would be just normal again. Uh, I, I couldn't, I couldn't have imagined that. So it's, I hoped for it, but I, I honestly didn't, I didn't know, um, I didn't know if it would happen. So I'm, I'm just so glad. Well, like I remember um, there is this, I wrote down um, this quote that, or what Ayu said to you in the film too, is that like, you know, you're gonna need, um, a lot of courage, you know, after, after getting your tattoos, um, which, which is so true, because yeah, it, like you were saying at that point, not very many people were getting the tattoo. So yeah, obviously it was kind of like a, it seemed to have been kind of like a, like, oh my gosh, <laughs> kind of moment. And, um, and, and again, uh, 
as it's evident in the film too, like the conversation that you've had with your parents. Um, yeah, that must have been. Yeah, you, you you could see it in the film like that. It, it was it was definitely a, a it must have been a hard decision. Um, but for you, only you can really know what. Yeah, what's good for you. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I mean, I, th <laughs> I think it's a tough moment in the film that will play out forever because and it's forever immortalized on film, but. Um, it, it was really very quick that my mom came around and we made peace with um, what had happened and really in the end she was so supportive leading up to my getting a tattoo and, and very supportive after afterwards. It was a very short period of time that she was upset and I think it, it was just because it brought up so much emotion for her, um, you know, because her generation, um, I think felt the worst of um, the shaming that colonization brought. And um, those of us who are younger have had less of that. I mean, we still get it. There's still lots of lateral violence and, and, um, and also Christianization that has made it difficult sometimes for younger Inu to explore our, our history and our or just traditional spiritual beliefs and stories and all of that. Um, but generally we're brought up in a school system that doesn't literally tell us that we're to be ashamed of ourselves and that our language is shameful and our culture is shameful. Like at least our schools, they might not be teaching that stuff enough, but at least now they're not actively um, mm -hmm. trying to take it away. Um, or at least they don't admit it. <laughs> um, so there's my cynicism coming in. Um, but I think, you know, our, our mother's generation and grandmother's generation were very much shamed for that stuff. So it was harder. Like, I think it was a very, um, you know, it brought up all of those feelings to, you know, to get my face tattooed was very much confronting um, the narrative of being told that we're, we shouldn't try to be Inuk anymore. It was a very, very um, clear statement against that attitude. So um, I think it brought up a lot of feelings for my mom. Um, so it was for a moment really hard for her to reconcile um, her upbringing in the Qallunat school system and then and then being confronted with a daughter that she had raised to be proud of her language and culture. And I was walking the walk of what she had been um, teaching me mm. my whole life. Uh, so um, it was an interesting moment, I think, of reconciling our, our colonial history and, and who we're striving to become as people. So um, it was a tough emotional conversation for both of us, but I think it's, I think it's a conversation we're all having as a people. So um, I'm grateful to my mom that she let me put that in the film and keep it in there. And then she helped me, me translate it for the narration and the voiceover. So it was a very, um, you know, very emotional and, and tough process that she really, in the end, was very supportive of me doing. Yeah, and that, that reminds me of, of that uh, scene too, where you're um, talking about your your dad's reaction as well and then how I it was I found it so interesting how you turned it into like a script as well so I did. my dad did what my father did my oh, father wrote it down okay yeah yeah we okay. had the verbal conversation and then when I asked him to talk about it with me on camera he didn't want to go on camera but he he did he was okay with me sharing what he said, but he didn't want to be on camera himself. He hates being on camera. So, but he didn't want to, to hold my film back by not agreeing to be in it. So he wrote down um, the conversation we had and, and handed it to, to me. And then I had to read his words basically. So um, yeah, that's funny. I, for, I forgot, I forgot that. 
Um, it never occurred to me that people might um, interpret it as my me having written it, but it, uh, I should have mentioned that, I guess, in the film. Uh, nobody's ever asked me that before. It was actually my dad's words that he wrote. It's, uh, it's very meta. <laughs> 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 yeah. Oh. yeah, they both have a tough time with it, and they were both very supportive in the end of the process. And and now it's ten years later, and I have my tattoos, and it's never held me back from anything in life. So, um, I think I think they're both now like just relieved that it hasn't affected me negatively. And if anything, it's been a, a very positive um, change in my life. Mm -hmm. And I think the the other important aspect of it is that we might not have as much um, racism as before for us being Inuk, but what I've noticed is uh, because on television, um, they always have the these films with the American models with big eyes, uh, um, blonde hair, long legs, and everything. And I also noticed how it affected some of my friends' self-esteem because they thought that because they're Inuk, they're uglier because of uh, the television. But um, seeing uh, more and more films, including Inuit and also traditional aspects that were taken away but being brought back, I think it's also important as uh, for their self-esteem as a person, mm -hmm. you say that um, when you see yourself in a TV, um, another Inuit, another indigenous person on TV, you're like, oh, no, uh, it's not me who's ugly, it's the society who pretends to know who can be pretty and who can be ugly or anything. So seeing um, like, uh, there was this new issue with Elisapi on the cover of the magazine and so many uh, young girls felt so empowered by seeing it. Yeah. So I think that's also another very important aspect of uh, your documentary. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. I'm so proud to see that um, the magazine cover with Elisapi on it too. She looks incredible and um, she's so beautiful. and. Um, you know, it was, it was Nelly Kusuga I interviewed. This is one of those interviews that I would love to put online someday. But Nelly Kusuga talked about uh, beauty standards and how Western beauty standards are about looking uh, as young as possible. And, you know, um, whereas in a beauty, beauty standards were about um, looking healthy and having wisdom. And um, that's what we aspire to, uh, whereas Western beauty standards tend to pressure people to be unhealthy um, mm -hmm. often. So um, it was eye opening for me. Um, I wasn't thinking about any of that when I started my research. I just thought, oh, those are cool and beautiful. I want to know more about them. Um, but it opened opened up all these questions about different things and. Um, talking to her was really mind expanding because she was talking about, you know, we can have different sets of beauty standards. We can have different things that are important to us. That's what it is to have a different culture. So um, I, I love that about our tattoos. It, it instantly tells the world we don't ascribe to the same beauty standards and, and it's okay to have different ones. Yeah. I'm just just thinking about it now of like tattoo tattoos in general like on on anybody like if, if you know any sort of like visible tattoo like years ago you know you would have um like i my parents you know they they would say like oh well um you know it'll be difficult you know for you to get a job and then like to it, it, it was like, if you had a tattoo, a, um, a visible tattoo, like even on your face or neck or anything, then it would be hard for you to like, uh, get like a respectable job kind of thing. So, but that has all changed now. And so it's, it's, um, it's really interesting, like how 
society has changed. Uh, yeah, even in Western society, it's uh, changed. Yeah, definitely. Many years ago, you would not get a tattoo. Like, you'd make sure you can cover it with a shirt or whatever. And I always thought that was funny that Inuit tattoos start on the hands and the face, exactly the places where Western society don't <laughs> it used to be like a tattoo anywhere except for there because you can't cover it up. But um, for us, it wasn't something to be ashamed of, right? It's something to be proud of. So, of course, you're going to put it where people can see. Mm. What's also inter interesting is um, uh, in New Zealand with the Maori, Maori nation, where they're so proud of having their face tattoo and it's so important. Um, they're very protective of it because they know how much it's important. So not anyone can just, just decide to get these tattoos. It has to come with um, um, with all their cultural baggages that it comes from. And learning about Tuni made me realize um, it's not only Inuit, but there are so many cultures in the world that have their traditional tattoos. Yeah, most cultures until Christianity came along. Um, and not just indigenous cultures, but cultures everywhere. Um, if you look far back enough, just about everybody had beautiful, ta rich tattoo traditions and then Christianity came along and, and wiped that out there. I think it says somewhere in the Bible, Bible not to mark your skin. Um, I think that's where it comes from. Um, and I have, um, so in my upcoming exhibition too, I, I, I did uh, include an archival photo of a Labrador woman um, with these amazing um, hair, hair pieces, beaded hair pieces, kind of, you know, of, the, of this length. And, um, but uh, it, it, in working with our, our graphic designer here, you know, we blew up the image. Um, so it's like full wall size, it's beautiful. But um, like it was only, you know, until we blew it up that we noticed that on her face, what, you know, it being an archival photo, I, we were thinking that maybe, um, maybe her tattoos had been kind of like painted out. Mm. So it, it was. Really? Um, I I can't be yeah. so sure, but I'm I'm thinking like that. That is. No one is yeah. yeah. Um, which is yeah, unfortunate. But again, it may the be hair though, like I love that you're looking at that stuff because you know tattoos bring up the conversation about all kinds of beautification and not just beautification but decoration um, um, that might have been tied to spiritual practices or you know um, other customs that it wasn't just about being aesthetically beautiful, um, but. Um, it also raises questions about men and did they tattoo and what kinds of things did we do to decorate ourselves and express our culture so I love learning about piercings and hairstyles and clothing and all of that it's all just these are all expressions of who we are and um, ways to describe who we are as individuals but also um, as members of our own communities so I love thinking about all that stuff and learning about it. You're lucky and you get to do the work you do, Jocelyn. You must see so many beautiful things. I, yeah, I'm, I'm very, very lucky to be, to be working in, um, to be working in all of this uh, beautiful artwork. <laughs> mm -hmm. I'm just surrounded. Mm -hmm. um, and then, yes, it, uh, seeing those, the tattoos and, and um, the, the clothing even too, um, reflected back, you know, into, mm -hmm. yeah, but having that reflected in, in like drawings and prints and uh, carvings, um, yeah, it's just, I am lucky. <laughs> um, Oh, it, yeah. Uh, so I was gonna, I was gonna ask you, Alicia. Actually, um, did you? I know that um, I have seen 
some some men nowadays nowadays at least uh, wearing the uh, or having the tattoos, traditional tattoos. But um, I mean, I I'm not so sure about uh, the history of of men wearing having the tattoos. Did you did you get into any of the research on on men having tattoos? I I tried. Um... I didn't get as far as I would have loved to. And I think that's partly because um, I'm a woman. And I, I think if I was um, a man, uh, people might have opened up more about men's tattoos. Or if I was a man, like different elders would have reached out to talk to me about, you know, because I didn't talk to all. all all the elders all across and then it was you know certain people that were open and willing to talk to me and and um who knows maybe a different subset of elders would have reached out and talked to me about tattoos had I been a man so I think there's lots of research to be done out there and I hope a young man takes that on and and uh, researches that and makes a film about it because um, I think there's a lot of young men that are also yearning to reconnect with um traditional culture and that lots of young men want to get tattoos and um, wish to know more. I, I Men did tattoo. Um, I can tell you a few things that I know. Um, men did tattoo, but not generally not ex as extensively as the women did. Um, I was told um, by Alpi um, he was from the Natalik region, but lived in Rankin toward the end of his life. So um, he told me that tattoos, men's tattoos were often um, more, I guess, uh, representational, like a drawing of something. So he used like a drawing of a caribou as an example. So if, if your um, helping spirit was a, a caribou, for example, then you might get a tattoo of a, a caribou. Um, or, um, you know, people had amulets as well, you know, items that were like either for good luck or spiritual protection or, or that kind of thing. And he said that tattoos could also kind of be used like amulet, like amulets. Um, and I also heard from other elders that um, because when you tattoo your body, you're tattooing uh, it's not just your body you're tattooing, it's also your soul. So that when you die, your body will disappear, but your soul remains and the tattoos remain with your soul. And that those markings um, are what make your soul visible and recognizable in the afterlife. So um, tattoos could be used to identify you or even to obscure your identity. Um, to, uh, to spirits that you want to recognize you or to not recognize you. So for example, if you had killed um, a whale or a polar bear or even a human, um, a spirit that's a, a strong, powerful spirit that could take revenge on you if you, for killing them, that they might um, tattoo a line across their face. Um, to protect them from revenge so that 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 spirit wouldn't recognize them anymore um so um there there were there were tattoos um that were men's there was also one where it was three figures holding hands on the shoulder and i've heard a couple different theories but i'm not confident on what it means so i'm hesitant to uh to say without confirmation because they were really just theories um, from people who were unsure but you know there were there were definitely men's tattoos um, I also read about from one of the old explorer books and I don't remember which explorer <laughs> um, I should take it out again but it mentioned um, a few lines being tattooed on the wrist of a man um, to make him um, better at throwing a harpoon um, but it didn't say whether the lines were vertical like or like vertical like this or horizontal like the women's um, 
Although women could also have vertical ones. I've, I, I saw some, um, some of the elders I interviewed had seen vertical lines like that on some women. So they could, they could go either way. Um, but those men's harpoon lines, I don't know which direction they went. I just read that a, a written um, description saying a few lines on the wrist. So, um, and then there were special tattoos for um, shamans. Like if you're training to become a shaman, they would put, uh, it's called a gigjuga, um, a line across with three little lines coming down, either across the bridge or actually, I think it was right between the eyebrows, if I'm not the nose. Um, so there's little tidbits that I, that I know um, or have heard directly from elders. Um, but my knowledge is not extensive on men's tattoos. And I, I really wish somebody will take that on and um, interview elders while, while we still have living elders that have seen those things yeah, or, or been taught about them from their elders. So I've, I've been noticing um, even recently with, with some of the uh, Inuit tattoo artists, um, discussions around uh, others appropriating uh, tattoos. Um, how, and, you know, this, this cultural appropriation doesn't, you know, uh, it, you know, it doesn't fully apply just to tattoos but then it can extend to like our clothing as well. So I was wondering like, from this is a question for both of you too, is like how, how, have you, um, how have you dealt with the, yeah, the issues around cultural appropriation mm -hmm. versus like even cultural appreciation? Mm -hmm. It's, um, it's a it's a conversation I, I wasn't aware of and didn't know how to talk about when I made Dunit. Um, since I've made it, I've been brought into a lot of discussions around appropriation, appropriation and um, as I was interviewing elders, I asked the question, how would you feel about uh, non-Inuit getting our tattoo patterns? Um, but I didn't know the term cultural appropriation yet. I just knew it was possible that some people might take interest in our patterns and copy them. And uh, when I asked elders, I got such a range of reactions. Um, some of them were like, oh, that's that would be weird. <laughs> um, some of them were like, oh, that'll never happen. Haluna wanted us to stop getting tattoos. Why would then they turn around and get them, you know, like it was just mind boggling to think that that could be, that could possibly happen when it was outside culture that forced us to stop getting them in the first place. Um, and some, some were like, I guess I don't care. I guess it would be like nice if instead of condemning that part of our culture and wiping it away that they became supportive of it. I guess that would be nice. Um, but most were like, no, I don't want that. <laughs> um, like they tried to take it away and that would feel like it's getting taken away all over again. Um, so, you know, it, it was interesting to hear all the different perspectives from elders, but as, as time's gone on after the film came out, um, our society's had a chance to have a lot of conversations about appropriation. And I think everybody's got their own personal opinions on it. But generally speaking, I find a lot of, um, especially younger Inuit, insist that Kalunat should not get them, um, that they're, you know, we're trying to reclaim our identity and, um, after it being so forcibly taken away, it, it, we should be allowed to um, have it to ourselves for a while at least. Um, if you look up um, to Neat on the Cinema Politica site, there's like a, 
uh, Q&A that I did for an audience in Montreal and we talk quite a bit about cultural appropriation in that in that video clip so um, maybe when you put this out you could link to you could link to that as well because I found that conversation to be useful um, yeah the, I think a lot of the tattooists that are doing tattoos now have slightly different opinions on who can get tattoos and when and whether men can get women's tattoos or um, you know whether Kadluna can and um, putting the tattoo patterns on clothing and selling those is it okay for non Inuit to do that and you know it, there's there's so many different ways to think about it but I think generally personally uh, I would love if other cultures gave us the respect of giving us time to reclaim um, our tradition and make it really strong again and let us decide when it's okay to share with others. It's so different on depending on what I know for sure like if someone a non-Inuit go up north and you're freezing to death of course we're going to give them our clothing but mm -hmm. I think the part that gets um um that creates a little bit more friction is when non a non Inuk learns how to make some clothing and they sell some for profit. I think that's where it generates more conflict since um 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 like some people they make their living out of making clothes for the mm -hmm. family or um, to people sell it and having um, these Inuit inspired or like um, Inuit clothing not being made by Inuk um, it can be um, it does create some frictions and I think the hardest part is trying to have a conversation about it with some people that are appropriating um a culture that is not there is um i kind of find it weird how they will find something beautiful from another culture and appropriate it but when someone from that culture um voiced themselves about it to that person i've seen a lot of uh, blocking people blocking after being told that they were, they have been culturally appropriating and that's I think that's kind of insulting how um, they appropriate something that is not there, but they don't get they don't they also don't want to learn more or hear about someone who is actually living that culture. Mm -hmm. It's um you know it's such a it's a it's a complex conversation because when people from away move into our communities, we want them to be welcome and to learn about us and to engage in our culture and learn our language. And, you know, so, and then where's the line where it becomes appropriation, right? And um, for me, what I tell people when it comes to clothing and jewelry, um, to me, the tattoos are off limits. <laughs> but when it comes to clothing and jewelry, it's if you're buying Inuit made art, whether it's clothing or jewelry or, or artwork that goes on your walls, um, that's a good thing to, because that's supporting Inuit artists and helping them make a living and um, helping us keep our culture and skills strong by buying things that we make. Um, and then I also personally don't mind when non-Inuit learn how to sew those things for their own family. Like if you're going to clothe your own family, and you're, especially if you're living in the North, it's good to be able to sew those for your own kids. Mm -hmm. um, but the line is, I agree with what you said, Olivia, is when they start to take those things and, and sell them um, from Inuit made patterns or um, Inuit designs, um, mm -hmm. that, 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 that bothers me because that's taking away income from Inuit. Mm -hmm. 
another complex nuance that I've been asked about recently is with artwork. Um, like um, if artists are drawing images of Inuit or uh, Northern imagery, what's called appropriation, what's not. Um, and, and for me, uh, like I, I'm an, I was trained as an illustrator. Um, my husband and I are both illustrators. We went to Sheridan College and took an illustration there. That's how we met. He's not Inuk and I'm Inuk. Um, and full disclosure, he's done lots of illustration of Inuit. Um, so it's something that we've had to think about a lot, like what's appropriate and what's not. And, and for me, uh, there's a line when, if you're an artist or any kind of creator, if you're living in an Inuit community and are providing a service, uh, like it, with illustration, it's a commercial service that you provide. People approach you and say, I need a drawing of this. And you buy that from them. If you're living in an Inuit community, you should be able to give a service to your community that's being asked of you by Inuit. And so to me, that's acceptable. If an Inuk approaches my husband and says, I'm writing a book and I want you to do drawings of children doing this and the mother has tattoos and you know, if it's being controlled by Inuit and being requested by Inuit, I'm okay with that. The difference then is if let's say, let's say my husband started doing um, all kinds of paintings to go in a fine art gallery and he's choosing himself to represent Inuit, that's when I start to feel uncomfortable because um, I don't think a non-Inuk should be choosing how our culture gets represented um, to the outside world. Um, and then what especially bothers me is if somebody makes artwork that looks like it might have been made by an Inuk and they're not clear about their identity and they're just putting it up online or up for sale somewhere mm -hmm. and they don't say whether they're Inuk or not. Um, to me that's like trying to pass as an Inuk and hoping nobody will notice and buy the artwork because they think it's an Inuk who made, who made it. That's really troublesome for me as well. Yeah, also something like um, I've been seeing a lot of books written by non-Inuit, uh, either like doctors that went up north, social workers, teacher, um, like whatever work to can get up north and writing about it. I don't, I don't, I find it okay if they want to, they can write about anything they want. But the thing is that there's also um, Inuit writers, um, writing about life and stories and everything about the north and i think like one of my friends told me that for one of their courses at the CGEP, um he was reading a book written by a, a woman that used to be a nurse up north about the north and i think it was the first time that he was really reading something related to the north and I find it kind of like it's okay, but there are so many stories that you know we can tell, and there's so there's like a lot more books than there used to be. Like it's not traditionally um, part of our culture, the writing a book, but the narrating a story is a very important aspect of our culture. And I know so many Inuit who have so much to say and. Um, I've got to meet some people that write all the time and they want to publish books. So I think it will be more interesting if people got to learn about Inuit from Inuit instead of someone who went up north kind of like in the outside perspective that they cannot really understand how sophisticated uh, situations can be up north. Uh, just example of family when i when people ask me to explain how my family tree works up north it, it gives me a headache <laughs> but like these are stuff that we understand as <laughs> as inuit and uh i think it would be more interesting and more we will learn a lot more if we read it from someone who actually is living that culture is living that 
a way of life um, that can understand it um, better than someone who went up north for a year to work. Yes. <laughs> Rich. <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, just wrapping things up a little bit, um, I, I thought I'd uh, see if anybody out on social media wanted to ask you questions. I only got a couple couple questions though from people <laughs> so, um, so I'll go ahead and ask them um, so Alicia Smith uh, who I believe she works with the NFP too um, she was wondering so she uh, she said that she first saw Tunit um, in the Kaluid, like yeah 10, 10 years ago so probably when it came out um, okay. So she, yeah, she was wondering like what it's been like for you, Alethea, like since then too, um, of, of screening your film in Nunavut and or even across the circumpolar regions. Yeah, and how has your, the audience responses changed uh, since then? If Oh my gosh, yeah, that was an intense screening. I think I remember that she was there at the Ikharit premiere and um, I was blown away thinking like, oh, I hope at least a few people show up to my screening at the Ikharit movie theater. And it was packed. I mean, I was so thankful to the theater owners. They let people go in and like totally illegally cram the theater. It was like people were lining the walls, standing up for the whole screening and sitting on the stairs and everything. It was just packed. Um, they stopped doing that after that. <laughs> but for that one screening, they let it happen. And I was so nervous. Um, but it it happened and you know not a lot of people had really seen my tattoos yet because I had gotten them tattooed. I, I wanted to wait till um, I was finished the film and all the research before getting tattooed so I got the tattoos in August, um, edited the film for a number of months and then the, and then the film came out. Um, uh, I screened it in Nicaragua that November so like some people had seen me around town, of course, going to the grocery store, but to have hundreds of people packing the theater and, and watching it all together at once, once was an incredible experience. And um, there was so much crying <laughs> um, and laughter. Um, it was wonderful. And I felt so relieved that my own community um, received the film so well. And um, it was years after, and it's still to this day, that I get messages from Inuit from all over asking my help and advice to plan their tattoos and they want to know more. And um, for a number of years, it was really overwhelming because I was getting like sometimes a few messages a day from people asking for advice and I just couldn't answer everybody. Um, it would have been like a full-time job so I really tried to answer everybody to at least say, I'm really sorry, I'm busy, but here's my film. Like you can watch the film. So it was great to be able to just um, say, please watch the film, here you go. Um, but it, it's still a big part of my life and I still get asked questions and the questions are changing. And, and um, you know, just the other day I had a conversation with somebody about how tattoos fit for, for someone who's transgender and um, what about people of different sexualities and gender orientations and all that so and what was Inuit sexuality like and what how did Inuit feel about um, gender was it was it a binary system the way the western world has treated it for so long and um, so the questions are getting more complicated now um, and um, it's it's continued to be thought provoking for me and it's continued to make me really think carefully about what my beliefs are and who who i am and what what being inuk means to me um and i think it raises those questions for other people as well so it's 
it's continued to be a huge part of my life. I think when you spend this amount of time making a film and digging that deep into your soul and asking yourself those kinds of questions, a film like that becomes part of who you are for the rest of your life. Uh, like I, I'm, I'm pretty much tattoo obsessed to my dying day now, I think. <laughs> um, and um, I, I wouldn't want it to be any other way, but um, it's a good thing I love talking about tattoos because this film just goes on and on and on and keeps getting watched by classrooms and you know people all over you name it and I get pulled into conversations about it still 10 years later and um, I love it I love it but it's also wonderful that the the custom has taken off again and been embraced by so many people again and that there are other Inuit that are also becoming real knowledge holders about tattoos and doing their research and um, you know most of my research was with living elders um, and their their own memories but there are other Inuit now that are also doing a lot of research into the written record from explorers and ethnographers and stuff and I did do a fair bit of that, but it, in terms of my film, I focused on the living memories. Um, so it, it's great that that um, the work of sharing that knowledge is really being shared by a number of different people now. And so that's taken a big load off my shoulders because for a while it felt like everyone in the world was coming to me <laughs> um, about tattoos and I couldn't handle it all. Um, it was a responsibility that I felt like wasn't just mine. I was scared of like my personal opinions becoming like too given too much weight when I was just learning to. Um, so I'm really glad that there's like a whole group of, you know, Penning Wak in Greenland and Huvak in the Western Arctic and Solina and Ipix out here in Iqaluit and um, um, you know, there's, there's people in Alaska and, you know, there, there's, there's so many people now doing tattoos and, and they're kind of magnets for tattoo knowledge now as well. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's just part of who I am now. <laughs> um, and this film is definitely part of my history and, and um, will always be a big part of my life. Yeah, I think we lost Olipika on the call. Yeah, we did. Unfortunately, she just sent me a message uh, that she that she lost her internet. Oh, no. Apparently, Darn. it happens in Montreal, too, not even just in Minnowood. <laughs> um, I guess great with her she had lots of interesting things to say definitely I know um, Olivia if you're if you're watching this after <laughs> yeah. oh my goodness um, it was so lovely to, to speak with you um, and we'll we'll have to we'll have to speak with her again too yeah well it sounds like she's gonna make more films so yeah I'm sure we'll be talking to her again yeah yeah I'm really um, glad to meet you. Nice to see you. Um, there's one one last question too from oh yeah from from Instagram. Uh, Miss Phoebe, she was wondering uh, who inspires you in your work and uh, and also in, just in general. Oh my gosh! Wow, so many inspirations. Where do I start? <laughs> How long can I take with this answer? <laughs> um, hmm. As long as you want. <laughs> Going back to my grandmother. <laughs> Just kidding. I mean, I'm not kidding. It, it is true. My grandparents and my mom and dad and, you know, everyone in my family are a very strong foundation for me. Um, how they live their lives, how they... Uh, carried themselves and you know asked questions and were determined learners and careful workers and you know um, those are all things that are important to me and my my family are are big inspirations in that way um, I'm lucky to come from a family of hard workers and 
creative people. And um, in terms of artistic inspiration from elsewhere, um, my gosh, there's so many, but Helen Hegg Brown comes to mind. She's um, uh, a filmmaker from British Columbia. Um, she's Chilcotin and an incredible, incredible filmmaker. She's just such a thoughtful, thoughtful person, intelligent person, just emotionally wise and uh, really, really works to bring her own um, culture and um, worldview into how she makes films too. Uh, not just the subjects of the films, but in the process of filmmaking as well. It's incredible. I could, I could talk for an hour about the ways that she works that inspire me. Um, I won't. <laughs> um, I love my Instagram. Like what the people I follow on, on Instagram are so heavily beadwork tilted. <laughs> um, and there are just so many incredible um, bead artists that I follow on Instagram and not just beading, but jewelry in general and fashion. And um, I'm, I'm an earring junkie. These are Tanya Larson creations. Um, she's Gwich'in. Um, and I find the artistry in jewelry and clothing fashion in indigenous fashion is at such a level that is just beyond the rest of the fashion industry, in my opinion. The, the, the work, the care, the spirit and soul, the, I mean, just the thought and effort that's put into indigenous fashion is just overall on a level that is just above and beyond um, generally what Western society does. So that's an inspiration for me in my film work that I wanna have that kind of level of um, care and um, intelligence. And um, it's like, it's just never lazy. It's just so, so much love put into the work. And I want to carry what they do in fashion over into what I do in my film work. Um, Somebody that's been coming to my mind a lot lately is Janet Brewster. Uh, her Twitter handle is Pitsula. She's um, the deputy mayor here in Iqaluit, but she's also like, she makes jewelry, she does sculpture, um, she, but just also her whole personality and existence is such a force of love combined with rage <laughs> at injustice you know she's she's the woman in Ikhaluit that goes around finds you know negative graffiti and like covers it over with loving messages and i feel like that's just her in a nutshell you know her art her life her existence her work whether it's in policy or jewelry like she just takes things she sees you know negative things in the world and just consciously takes it down with love <laughs> and I love that I love that about her um that that's you know I have a thousand little anecdotes about people like that that I see some of them are you know friends in real life and some of them are people just I just see on social media um but that have had a big impact on how I look at the world and little aspects of the way they think that I try to take into my work uh what what are you what are you currently working on and what what uh what should we look forward to <sighs> i'm scared to even answer that question <laughs> um too many things i'm looking over here because i have a board over there on the wall that's um my business partner stacy outlook mcdonald she's from Holotok, but lives here in Iqaluit now and we work together a lot on a lot of different things we did the Grizzlies movies, movie together with um, our, our friend and colleague, Miranda Deponcie, and we're working on some new projects together. And one of them is um, we are trying to develop a 
a comedy series. Um, I'm making this space just because I'm hopeful it goes, but we're not sure yet if it's going to happen. We're trying really hard. It's uh, Stacy's baby. It's her concept that she came up with, and we really work together to try to bring to reality, and we should know soon if it's really happening. So that's a comedy drama. Um, we're also developing a podcast. We don't know if it's going to be any good, <laughs> but we're going to try. <laughs> it's called Wine Chips Google. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, we have the common thing that we always said as kids, let's go get Pop Chips Google. Pop and chips and uh, Google in the Inuktitut for cocoa, chocolate. It's just, let's go get some junk food so we can hang out and chat. And uh, our grown-up version of that is wine chips Google. We don't, haven't put it out yet, but it, it's 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 coming, and we're really nervous about it. Um, yeah. Oh, and um, we're pro we're producers on a project called Twice Colonized. Um, we're working with the um, some of the same team that worked on Angry Inuk. Um, I'm not the the director this time, but um, uh, it's a, a Danish woman uh, named Lynn, who's good friends with Ayu Peter, who is also in Tunit, but also in Angry Inuk, uh, my feature documentary. Um, I like to joke that I've made a career of making films with Ayu in it. <laughs> um, she's also obviously a big inspiration in my career uh, and in my life. So uh, that film is called Twice Colonized because uh, it's very much about Ayu and her life. Um, uh, as being being born as a Greenlandic Inuk and then moving over to Canada. Um, so she's experienced colonization in, uh, from two different nations. And she's working on a, an autobiography of that title. So we're producing um, a documentary about, about her life that's kind of linked with the book as well. So um, I'm also very early stages of development uh, on a documentary called Poison, which is about persistent organic pollutants and how they all end up in our waters, in our land, through the environment, um, both the air and the ocean. You know, all the world's toxins kind of circulate and end up up here due to the way the air and ocean currents work. So. Um, that's one that's kind of rumbling around in my head and I haven't quite figured out how to make yet, but I'm, I can't stop thinking about it. So I guess it's going to have to be a film. <laughs> wow. It's so busy. My goodness. <laughs> yeah. That's some of them. Um, you know, these projects take years. So you, it's, it's as an independent um, production company, we're, we're always having to balance you know, sometimes you don't work full time on all these. It's not like I have 10 full time jobs, you know, um, you spend a couple of weeks writing on this project and then you focus on the next one for a bit. And, and because it takes years to make and to raise the money to make these things, you kind of have to try to stack them in a stage so you can kind of work on all of them bits at a time and you never know which one's going to get fully funded and, and go. Um, so it, it, you know, being, being an independent filmmaker is always kind of a risky game, risky career. You never know if you're going to have a job next month or next year. <laughs> um, but I've managed to keep it going for 17 years now. So I guess I'll keep at it. <laughs> well, Kwana, Alethea, for your time and um, for your words and um, yeah, I was I was very much looking forward to this interview with you and and also Juana too for uh, Olivia as well. Um, yeah, yeah. It's too bad we didn't get to say bye, but it was super cool to meet her. And I'm really coveting your earrings right now. I I hope to own a pair of your earrings someday. Your your earring and shirt combination are you're killing it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I'll, I'll, I'll make you some. Yay! <laughs> we'll be in touch. We'll be in touch. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much. I